My name is Will. And I'm Karen. And unlike Mulder and Scully... We both want to believe. So we've embarked on a journey of discovery. We've talked to people deeply entrenched in the spiritual and metaphysical world. We've thrown ourselves into weird and wonderful experiences. I even joined a coven of witches. And, wait, you joined a coven? Yep, all in the interest of finding something... Anything. ...that will prove that there's something beyond this physical... Three-dimensional world we all live in. This is The, the Skeptic, Skeptic Metaphysicians. Metaphysicians. Welcome back to the Skeptic Metaphysicians. We have a special treat for ourselves today because we are (laughs) excited to have one of our all-time favorite guests back on the show. Jonathan Robinson came on a little while ago and he, oh my gosh, the stories, the wisdom, the laughter that we had on the show was incredible. To this day, this is one episode that I keep going back to. When someone asks me, hey, I'd love to learn more about your show. What episode should I start with? Inevitably, it's Jonathan's episode because we had such a great time. So uh, without further ado, Jonathan, thank you so much for coming on the show. We're excited to see you again. Thank you for that great introduction. Now I'm, I'm really uh, going to have a hard time to live up to that reputation, <laughs> but we'll give it a shot. <laughs> well, no pressure. <laughs> I wanted to set the bar high so that you made sure to deliver because you always do. <laughs> Hey, I'm just glad he had us or is back. He had us back. We had, are having him back. He agreed. I'm glad he said yes. Yeah, I, I know. We finally. <laughs> small words. We, I got to use small words today. I'm all nervous. <laughs> we don't very often get repeat guests after a while. They're like, do we, we want me to do what? No, never again. These two. That was like traumatic experience. <laughs> but uh, so today we're talking about uh, talking about traumatic experiences. We're talking about something that's going to help hopefully a lot of people in our previous episode, you talked a lot about spiritual awakenings and how to get yourself from there, how to get reach spiritual enlightenment in a very short amount of time. And that was based on a book that you had. And I read it, by the way, and I loved it. And I, I go back to it all the time now. But now you have a brand new book, and it is in a very specific direction. And I'm just going to let you go ahead and set the table for the audience. Well, first, the name of the book is called Ecstasy as Medicine. And the subtitle is How MDMA Therapy Can Help You Overcome Trauma, Anxiety, and Depression, and Feel More Love. What you might not know, Will, is that I might be the only person alive that got a master's thesis done on the value of using MDMA, which is also known as Molly or ecstasy, um, for the treatment of PTSD. Um, Because I did that back in 1984, and then uh, three weeks later, the U.S. government made it illegal. And you may not mm-hmm. also know that in 2024, the FDA is going to make it a medically prescribed drug. This is something that they have never done in their entire history. And the reason they're doing it is because they found that ecstasy is the most effective pharmacological medicine ever created for treating a variety of conditions. And wow. after 40 years of studies, they had to say, well, okay, it's safe. It's ridiculously effective. It's 20 times more effective than the next best treatment. And they wanted to make sure that veterans who are killing themselves could stop killing themselves by taking this medicine and healing their trauma, anxiety, and depression. Wow. Yeah. So we're going to talk a lot about myths and, uh, well, we're going to debunk a lot of stuff, I think, because When I was growing up, I had some, I grew up in the greater New York area and Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people I used to hang out with were pretty savvy about this kind of thing. However, there's all kinds of things that said, if you do this, you can have, this is going to happen. Or if you do that, that will happen and all the dangers and stuff. And it was like part of the fun. But before we go into all that stuff, I I do want to touch on exactly what you talked about because not just MDMA, but also psilocybin and Mm -hmm. a lot of those psychedelic uh, medicines that were being explored back in the 60s um, that was doing a world of good um, from what I understand, and maybe you can help us steer the ship a little bit better. From what I understand, it was kind of like, hey, we're losing control of the young population. We need to stop this. And so they made it illegal. Yeah. Now, for them to come around all these years later and finally say, okay, we're going to open the door to this one do you think it's going to open the door to a lot of other things too? Well, I think it's going to open the door to having science decide things rather than politicians or fear. 
So what the science shows is that MDMA and also psilocybin are very effective for treating various conditions. And instead of having big pharma and money decide uh, and politics decide what's legal and illegal, let's decide it based on what actually works or what actually does not work. And that's a whole totally new thing. That took a lot of years and tens of millions of dollars to uh, show that the science proved this was very effective. And also the science has proved many things that we thought were effective really are not effective. Like antidepressants tend to be very ineffective. Mm -hmm. uh, studies have shown that ecstasy is actually 30 35 times more effective than some antidepressants. That's not a small mm -hmm. difference. No. no. It's wow. Not. Yeah. Before we get too deep into it, I, so I grew up pretty sheltered life. Like I have not been around a lot of drugs. What? I know, I know it's shocking, <laughs> but it kind of is shocking because I grew up in Florida, but yeah. <laughs> you got to survive there. No, but so, so things like ecstasy and psilocybin, were they created originally as like a, like an, a, a, as medicine, like with doctors and pharmacists, or were they, did they start out as like recreational drugs? Well, um, ecstasy was developed in 1912 by a company called Merck, but they didn't know about its healing properties until the 70s when a guy named Alexander Shulgin kind of made it popular. And uh, when I did my master's thesis, I was wondering, how are they going to abuse this drug? You know, because it, <clears throat> because it makes you feel good. It takes away your defenses. It makes you feel a lot of love and peace. And a lot of therapists were using it. And never occurred to me somebody might use it as an all-night dance party drug, uh, which you know can be fun. I've been to a couple of raves, but that's like using a, a laptop as a doorstop. You know, it works, but there's better uses. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so psilocybin. Uh, well, MDMA is a synthetic drug. Psilocybin comes from uh, mushrooms, so you could say that God created that as a way to uh, uh, make us see things beyond our normal waking everyday mind. Right. But then you could also say that uh, psilocybin or, or some mushrooms are poisonous. So yeah. maybe it's just like we're poisoning ourselves to uh, and instead of we just barely survive and get these uh, psychedelic trips. <laughs> well, I mean, was it luck of the draw? Some people are out there, they're hungry, they're looking around and they're eating mushrooms and wow. One of them yeah. died and the other one went on a trip. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have what he's having. <laughs> <laughs> you wait to be the third person to eat one of them. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but yeah, I think if I, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, John, because you know a lot more about this than I do. Although some people might think that some of my friends were going for a doctorate <laughs> in this kind of thing, but it weren't. <laughs> Uh, but I, I do think that it was meant to be kind of uh, medicinal, right? And, and then and then people got a hold of it and it got out and it did become a party drug. To your point, Jonathan, yeah, and, and not just not just MDMA, but but all kinds of drugs like that, LSD, psilocybin, mm -hmm. ketamine, all these things. You know, everything can be abused. You know, uh, sex is great, but rape is terrible. You know, so it's the same thing with drugs that that you can use them well for good purposes, for getting over challenges from your childhood or getting over depression, or you can use them to, uh, you know, have an all night party and, and uh, get sick. Um, well, so yeah. You had me up until the get sick part. <laughs> <laughs> I've done both. So, yeah. you know, really, um, it's really important as these drugs become more legal, like mer medical marijuana became legal. And uh, when what's happening with psilocybin is that different states are creating different laws. But with MDMA, it will be a federal law changing it, meaning it will be mm. in every state mm. because it will wow. be through the Food and Drug Administration. So that's right. a unique thing that's never been done before. It'll probably mm. happen sometime in 2024. And that's basically because the studies show how effective it is. You know, I can do two or three years worth of like weekly therapy in one afternoon with somebody on MDMA. So in this crazy wow. time we live in, you know, being able to do therapy that's quick, effective, and convenient is a lot, very much needed. <laughs> yeah. Now, is it addictive? I mean, is there that fear, like with the, the whole opioid thing that's going on now, people are getting over the pain, next thing you know, they're hooked on it. I mean, could that happen as well? Yeah, that's a great question. It ends up that's what could be called anti-addictive, meaning that 
the more you take it, the less effect it has. Oh. So even people who absolutely love this stuff generally won't take it more than once every couple months because if they do, it has no effect. So um, it's wow. not addictive, but you know, it, uh, every drug um, has some impact on the body. And one of the things I do in the ecstasy as medicine book is I talk about like several supplements you can take that mitigate the, the after effects. So that you're not tired the next day, for example. Right. And those are some of the things that we're going to talk about the, mm -hmm. the, the side effects. But before we do that, I want to talk about the benefits of it. Yeah, we already talked about the fact that it is extremely useful for veterans who are, are experiencing PTSD. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of research behind it. And it is remarkable to your point, several weeks of therapy in a single afternoon. And I've even heard to the point where after a single dose, some veterans have I don't want to say get better, but but have seen incredible results after a single dose. Has that been your experience? Yeah, you know the the current model is to give people three doses eight weeks apart. But um, what I do is I work with people over Zoom, believe it or not, where I get even better results than in person, which is a strange what? thing. Yeah, that's that's very. They strange. just look at it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the next step, Karen, you know, the placebo dose. I have a story about that. I'll, I'll tell later. But um, yeah, I do most of my work over Zoom and uh, I just do one session. I have a 93% success rate in curing people with PTSD in one session. One session. That's yeah. remarkable. Oh my gosh. Absolutely remarkable. Now, do people have to be, um, a lot of people, you know, they hide it. Or they don't want to admit, like, or they have a hard time uncovering the PTSD. Do they have to already be past that and kind of open and ready and, and know what's going on? Or can you work with both with this? We have the you same can work with, with both. both. Um, the actual studies done by the FDA were people with what was called severe PTSD, meaning they were not able to function in life. That's pretty severe. And yeah. they found that 85% of those people no longer. Uh, or 80% of those people no longer had symptoms of PTSD three months later. Wow. Oh my God. I'm thinking like this could solve the homeless population, you know, because you hear about all these people that just, they go through the medical system, they run out of money, they're still yeah. having all these mental issues. And next thing you know, they're on the street. Yeah. You know, in a, in a time yeah. like this, where we really need all the love and peace we can get and connection, I think this medicine has the potential to really impact the world in, in significant ways. Wow. Mm, no doubt about it. So PTSD, yep, check the box. It, when I think about ecstasy, um, and I've, and I've full disclosure, I've heard some of your shows where you talk about you and your wife doing it uh, for different purposes and things like that. So are there other, and I know that they're legalizing it for medicinal purposes coming up in next year, but it, is there a chance that this might be legalized wholeheartedly or do you think it's going to take more for it? but i guess before we go there we need to talk about the other benefits that it has to other folks that aren't veterans that have ptsd yeah um well probably a third of the people coming to me have ptsd but not severe stuff you know just lingering things from their childhood you know trouble with a parent uh having trouble in relationships a third of them are couples it's magical with couples i mean it's it's amazing. Um, I've saved mm. so many marriages with this. That, that uh, It's magical with couples, Karen. Magical <laughs> with couples. I mean, we've got a pretty good relationship. I, I can know. only imagine. Can you Holy imagine how Macarena. much better it would be? I mean, I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, right. You never know. Um, Session uh, booked. No. <laughs> You know, I don't think my, my wife and I would be married if it weren't for MDMA because, you know, we about 10 years ago faced an issue that we just couldn't get over. We did an MDMA session with a therapist and it was, it was done. We haven't had that wow. problem since. Um, and then maybe a third of the people come to me for spiritual enhancement. You know, this is a, a medicine that helps people get in touch with inner peace and love. And while they're on the medicine, I get various clues as to how they are creating or opening to this love. And when they're not on the medicine, um, they have like a breadcrumb trail back to that. You know, it used to take me an hour of meditation to get to a place of peace. 
with uh, the exercise and other things I've done. And now it takes only about 20 seconds. And that wow. makes a huge difference in my life, obviously. I would say do so. You, do you have to continue continue taking it? Or is this like you're good and you're set? Um, I like to take it about once a year. Um, oh, and that's okay. generally what I've been doing for about the last 20 years. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Now get this, Karen. Uh, Jonathan, I also heard the story about your folks <laughs> I'd love to, I'd love My to dad. have, I'd love to have you share this. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly why I'm going there. <laughs> so, um, you know, my parents were always wondering why I did all this spiritual meditation and gurus and such. And I said, well, you know, I'm going for a certain experience and in, in state of consciousness. And uh, I said, you know, there is a, a drug that kind of mimics that state of enlightenment or fully opening and loving and to my surprise, they said, you know, well, can we try it? And I, I said, okay. So, you know, I, I, told, I gave them the medicine. I told them how to create a good set and setting to take it. And, you know, I kind of forgot about it. And then a year later, I, I asked them, hey, by the way, did you ever take that MDMA I gave you? And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, we took it. And I said, so, so what happened? And they said, it didn't work. And I'm pretty skeptical, you know, uh, <laughs> I said, well, well, tell me exactly what happened. Like what happened that night? They said, well, we took the medicine. We waited like 15 minutes and we didn't feel anything. Well, it ends up, it takes about 45 minutes for it to take effect. <laughs> right. So I said, well, when, when it didn't work, what'd you do? And then they put on this big smile on their face and they said, well, you know, it ends up we had the most wonderful night of our entire marriage. <laughs> we ended up talking about how much we loved each other and how grateful we were for our lives. And then we cuddled for a couple of hours on the couch. It ended up being so wonderful. The only disappointment was that the drug never took effect. Well, <laughs> well, I'm laughing. I said, well, when was the last time you talked about how much you loved each other and cuddled on the couch? And they said, well, that never happened before. That's what made that night so wonderful. It's just too bad the drug never had any effect. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and, you know, that's one of the great, the great things about it is that, it, you know, LSD or psilocybin, you know you're on a drug. Right. But right. with ecstasy, you kind of feel like you're now we're on a drug. And when you take the ecstasy, you feel like, well, that's how I should be feeling. I should be feeling open and loving and peaceful. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, um, yeah. I mean, can I, can you, yeah. can I slip some to my dad, like stick in a sandwich? I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I love him, but he has become this very angry man. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know why. Yeah. And I just, God, I just, like, I pray for him. I, I, you know, meditate, send energy that way. And I just don't know. Like, can oh. you imagine him and Barbara doing it together? Okay. Wait a minute. Let's clarify. <laughs> no, I cannot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, we, we love you, Bob. We love yeah, you. Yeah. This is all in good in good. Uh, yeah, but spirits. I mean, if it would make him feel better and, and just make him be, a, he was used to, I, I don't know. He's yeah. just become this angry person. Well, you know, sad. as you get older, we often get set in our ways and we all need a vision as to what it's like if we didn't have all these accumulated obstacles on us. Mm -hmm. And that's what one of the things that medicines like this can do is they can give you that vision and um, you know, when I first took it, when I was 16, the next day I signed up for a meditation course. I said, that's where I want to be. How do yeah. I get there? You know? Right. Then that's such a, such an important point to make, especially on the show where we're talking about spiritual awakenings and, uh, things like that, where this is, this is, uh, I mean, lack of a better term, a fast track to feeling what the feeling is supposed to be like. Cause there's so many people that say, uh, I don't know if I'm doing it right. I mean, it's kind of, I, fi I feel like it might be, but this kind of gives you definitive, like, this is how it's supposed to be. Yeah, that's but where then, the target is. That's Yeah, exactly. But then does it make it easier to reach that target well, that's what the said. next time? Yeah, there's breadcrumbs that, okay. that, that are laid in, right? Yeah, it's like training wheels. You know, you need training wheels when you first learn how to ride a bike so mm -hmm. you don't fall. Um, once you know the target, and when I help people on journeys, I'm asking them a lot of questions like, okay, where do you feel your energy? Now, can you close that energy down? How do you do that? Can you now open it back up? What did you do to do that? So that you do have specific things you're doing in your mind and body that um, allow you to get back there without the medicine. 
And that's a great spiritual gift to be able to have mm. that type of information. And it's different for different people. Some people, it's, you know, doing something with their chest or even something with their hands where they spread their hands out, you know, like they're, you know, receiving Holy Spirit or something. Some people, mm. it's a, they'll hum or there's a song that plays in their head or there's a phrase like, it's all perfect. You know, it's very individual. And if mm. I can find their recipe for finding peace and love within, then I feel like I've changed their life. My gosh, absolutely. <sighs> now, does everyone have a positive experience or is it like alcohol? Some people are happy drunks and some people are, people are angry drunks. Yeah. Well, I've done about, in the last 40 years, I've led about 800 journeys. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd say two people had unpleasant experiences. So I'd say one in 400, you know, the only reason I can, and they weren't that unpleasant, they both thought it was valuable, but it wasn't fun for them. So mm -hmm. about one fourth of 1%, I would say has a unpleasant experience. Mm -hmm. um, one of the reasons I do this over zoom, I certainly wouldn't do any lead any other medicines over zoom, certainly not LSD or psilocybin. <laughs> Right. Um, you can't tackle them down to the ground when it's <laughs> trying to take the clothes off. Exactly. Or exactly. Um, is that it's very predictable. I mean, it's more predictable than aspirin. Mm. If you get 400 people aspirin, one, one of them is going to have a very bad experience, but um, it's very predictable that people have positive experiences. And um, also uh, in my protocol, I'm talking to the person we're doing therapy the whole time. Uh, so there's a real deep connection there. And if they start to have, you know, like sometimes we're going over difficult traumas, maybe a rape, maybe somebody they saw murdered and I'm able to calibrate how fast to go into that. And one of the things ecstasy does is it reduces blood flow to the amygdala, which is the fear center of the brain. So people can revisit these difficult places, but without the uh, fear or without the um, avoidance that they might normally have. Oh, Jonathan, yeah. I need some of those so <laughs> much. <clears throat> Can it help unblock suppressed memories? Um, well, that does happen for sure. in maybe, I don't know, 15% of cases mm -hmm. uh, where people had no memory of an event and in an environment that's safe enough and with the medicine, they feel safe enough for those, those memories to come out and be healed. Wow, that's okay. So, Will, I'll let you. I just have so many questions. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. One more, and then you can you can have okay, a turn. Go, absolutely, go for it. Go for, go for it. <laughs> Except for now, like, and I have too many, and I can't think of which one I'm gonna ask. Okay. Maybe well, then, well, then maybe it, 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 just give me one second. We need we need to take a break, but when we come back, I want to talk to you. I've got lots of questions that we want to turn our attention to the debunking part because I remember when I was growing up, the, there there was a a thought that if you did um, it when you did MDMA or ecstasy at the time, it, uh, it, uh, sucked all your spinal fluid out of your body, right? There's all these kinds of things that wow. you hear. So, uh, we are going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to dive into all those kinds of things. And then we're also going to let Karen just go at it. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Before we continue with the interview, I wanted to share another five-star review with you. Uh, this time, it's from Jory2008 from the UK. The subject is on a journey, and the review goes on to say, My journey to enlightenment started a couple of years ago. I'm not even sure what led me to your podcast, and if I'm honest, I wasn't sure it was going to be for me, a cynical Brit expecting some U.S. sensationalism. But you know, it's anything but that. It's genuine, it's honest, and it appeals to someone just like me that has all the questions but doesn't know who to ask. Keep doing what you're doing. I've devoured your back catalog and wait each week impatiently for a new episode where I will undoubtedly learn something new, question something I already knew, or ask a new question. Most people need to listen to this. Jury 2008, thank you so much for taking the time to leave this wonderful review for us. It really means a lot, and we are thrilled that you found our show and that it resonates so much with you. Do us a favor. 
please share our show with someone you think might enjoy it as well. Uh, we want to try to get these messages out to as many people on the planet as possible. Our goal is to raise the consciousness of the earth. And a great way to do that is to have others share our show so that more and more people join us in this journey of exploration. All right, Jory2008, thank you again one more time for the wonderful review. And if you'd like to hear your review read on the air, just go to Apple Podcasts and leave us a review there, or go to skepticmetaphysician.com and leave us a review on the website. Okay, let's get on with the show. Welcome back to the Skeptic Metaphysicians. We are here having a, another excellent, wonderful conversation with Jonathan Robinson. Uh, we are talking about MDMA otherwise known as ecstasy today, and all the benefits that it has, not only uh, with PTSD for veterans, um, and it just so happens that they're about to uh, approve MDMA medicinally in the United States here next year, which is a really great story because uh, of all the benefits behind it. But then we talked about the spiritual aspect of, of it as well. And Karen had a ton of questions I didn't let her ask. Oh, so sure. Karen, Here's your chance it, before we go down the other rabbit hole. Okay, so just one more. Okay. <laughs> so part of the reason I had, like I said, I lived a shelter life, but I also kind of kept myself away from drugs because I don't like to lose control. Yeah. So if someone is having a session with you and they're having these conversations, do they, are they still in control or are they like, woohoo, you know, how, how does that work? Yeah, it's good to make a distinction between MDMA and other psychedelics. With other psychedelics, there is a sense that you're losing control. Uh, I would say on MDMA, most people feel like they are more in control than they've ever been because really? they feel uh, no anxiety or fear. They feel clear headed. That's why I say it feels almost like like you've been on a you've been a little bit drunk your whole life, and now everything's very clear, and you feel <laughs> open, and you don't feel defensive. So there's, there is no sense of losing control in the way uh, of other drugs, except for maybe about 10 or 15 minutes when you first come on to it, because you're, mm -hmm. you're going through, you're kind of in between worlds in a certain way. Mm. So I think that the stuff that I did back, I mean, the stuff that a friend of mine did back <laughs> yeah, in the yeah. day uh, <laughs> was definitely different than what you're talking about, <laughs> because uh, now, full disclosure, I am... I'm a one hit wonder, right? I, I, drugs hit me, whether it's aspirin or other things, I don't need a whole lot for, mm -hmm. for me to have the effects. So for someone like me that gets, gets high on secondhand smoke, it, it, are there different, <laughs> um, I'm assuming there's different doses that people can do, uh, first of all, and then I'll ask you the follow-up question after that. Yeah, um, although there's not that big of a range for MDMA, a standard dose is about 120 milligrams. Uh, that works for most people. Some people are more sensitive, some people less. But one of the problems, and there are, re, you know, there are problems with this medicine. I do want to state them because anything that's powerful, you know, can potentially have a downside. One of the downsides is that. 50% of what's sold as ecstasy in America is not pure ecstasy. And that that's it. the problem. Yes. Um, there are test kits you can get. Uh, so, you know, a lot of it's, it has methamphetamine, it has bath salts in it, and those can be a problem. I would never use ecstasy in which somebody else I know and I've talked to hasn't used the same batch and they can tell me that's good stuff or that's bad stuff, hmm. you know, um, or tested like, it chemically. So no, let, I shouldn't say that. My friend had a really good time on it eventually, but at first it was very difficult. Maybe to your point, the bridging the two worlds, uh, getting yourself used to it might, might be what, what happened. But after a while, I was like, oh, this is actually nice. I mean, that's what he told me. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> very good friend there, and and probably you know after maybe fifteen minutes, I I like I like to tell people that you're probably going to go through a fifteen minute period where you feel kind of discombobulated, maybe even a little bit nauseous, and uh, then you'll feel good again, and that's pretty typical. Now, is it a pill? Well, it can take? be. It can be a pill. It can be a powder. It can be um, a crystal. Uh, it can be in any form, pretty much. Okay. But you don't smoke it, right? You actually just ingest it. No, yeah, you ingest it. Okay. All right. 
No spoons involved. And <laughs> <laughs> no sp- I've seen the movies. I'm not that sheltered. No, okay. <laughs> okay. That was cough medicine, Karen. Cough medicine. <laughs> Robitussin. All right. All right. Well, then let's turn our attention to the the myths, the all the things that that were out there. Uh, specifically made to get us to be afraid of going out there and taking it. Now, in all deference, uh, street drugs, probably not the best way to go about it because <laughs> you never know what, what, like you said, that's your point that yeah. it could be mixed with stuff and it, it might not be safe, mm-hmm. but, um, th- let's take one at a time. One of the myths that we heard, or one of the things, one of the scare tactics was that I mentioned it before we went on break, when you took ecstasy, it drained the spinal fluid of your body. And that's why you felt so tired the next day. Mm-hmm. Is any basis to that? Um, no, there's no basis to that. What happened was that the U.S. government was funding certain labs with the express desire to please show us anything that could possibly be harmful about the substance. So one of the guys who is a, had been a respected scientist showed that there was all kinds of stuff that could happen uh, as he dosed uh, monkeys and baboons with ecstasy. And th- the journal Science, a very respected journal, published his results, which were mm-hmm. really scary. Uh, it ends up, it came out that he had not used ecstasy. He had used enormous doses of methamphetamine, better known as speed. Oh, my oh God. My God. <laughs> so they had to retract the article. But in the retraction, you know, the media jumped on ecstasy kills baboons, you know, or or things like that, or creates holes in your brain. Uh, All of that was based on his research, which was, uh, we still don't know if he tried to sabotage it or what happened, but they do know that the, the subjects in this experiment didn't actually get any ecstasy. They got methamphetamine. So that um, didn't get the media attention when it was retracted. And that took like, you know, that was 15 years of, of bad publicity based on faulty science. Mm. When, the actual, when the actual science was done uh, effectively, they showed that um, there is, it does use a lot of the serotonin in your brain. And if you take ecstasy every day for a couple of weeks, that can really hurt your brain. Right. <laughs> But if you take ecstasy every day for a couple of weeks, it stops working after about day three. So nobody does that. <laughs> right. You've touched on a lot of the other myths I was going to touch on with the holes in your brains and all that kind of stuff. And um, one that it might have been used as an excuse, I don't know. But one of the things that you hear is that you lose complete all inhibitions. So if mm. you're in a club somewhere, you can do all kinds of things without even meaning to. Is that right? Is that real? Well, I would say the set and setting is really important. You know, if if everybody in your club is taken off their clothes, whether you're on ecstasy or not, you're probably going to do that yourself. (laughs) And if you're Uh... if you had if you had a drink or if you had ecstasy, it makes it even easier. So um, I would say that it loses your defenses, meaning you you are no longer. uh, taking everything so personally, you're more likely to feel a lot of love and want to connect with people. Can that be taken advantage of? Yes. Um, mm. But hopefully you you take it in a setting that is safe enough where people are not trying to take advantage of you. Right. So the people that you're sharing love with actually love you back. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's important. Uh-huh. So Karen, that's your natural setting. So I think you're good. <laughs> <laughs> Don't the guys show enough love? No, I don't know. You do. That's my whole point. That that is your natural yeah. state. It's oh, okay. it, it'll be no different. It'll be like it'll be like Jonathan's parents, where nothing happened, didn't take effect. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a set and setting is really important. I, I had one client come to me. They he had never had a spiritual experience, so um, you know we were working in that way to use the ecstasy for that. And during the journey, he said, "Oh, I feel more love and peace than I've ever felt in my life." Well, it ends up. That night, he calls me up and he says, you tricked me. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I took the other pill. It was a magnesium pill. It's good to take magnesium with ecstasy because one of the side effects is a tight jaw. And if you take a magnesium supplement, you don't have to worry so much about that side effect. 
Well, it ends up he had taken the magnesium pill earlier in the day with me. And because of the set and his intention, he was feeling all this love. Well, later <laughs> that day, he took the actual ecstasy and he was going through it again. <laughs> well, you know, your mental set or your intention really, and, and how you take it and who you're taking it with does make a big difference. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So you're not suggesting that people go to the club in Miami and take ecstasy and, and go raving. Although, I mean, not too much harm in that is what I'm hearing from you. Well, you don't know who else is in the club. You could be taken advantage of. Well, yeah. This day and age. Yeah, I guess you need to have like <laughs> guides with you. So Jonathan, what are you doing next weekend? <laughs> <laughs> just just tell me where and when will and <laughs> oh that'd be a fun podcast <laughs> right right uh all right so then walk us through this because obviously mdma is not widely available right now nor should you probably take this on your own or or should you is it safe to take like karen and i decide karen and i we're going to do it without a guide or do you really recommend we reach out to you and say, Hey, guide us, or can we do it on our own? Well, it depends what your intention is. If you want a therapeutic intention, a guide is really important because mm -hmm. when you feel so good, you don't generally by yourself decide, well, let me go back to that time when I was hit by my dad and five years old and had, you know, all this trauma. That's not generally right. where you go. Um, but it's a very safe drug. If you're getting real ecstasy to take by yourself, um, in, in the book, Ecstasy as Medicine, I talk about how to do a self-guided journey. I talk oh. about how to do a, a journey on your own with, your, with a significant other, a partner. So um, it's not unsafe if you're getting the real medicine, but it's harder to go deeply into therapeutic stuff on your own. All right. So I got to go there. And I know you don't, don't want me to go there, but I got to go there. You just said it. If you get real ecstasy mm -hmm. yeah now it is not currently available legally in the united states mm -hmm. so if someone wanted to do something like this that was not guided that was just karen and i how would someone go about getting something like this or should we not even talk about this so, i i know listeners are always interested in that so i you know i do a course on teaching people how to do mdma facilitated uh therapy and right. i have several hundred people in that course so you betcha this this uh, conversation comes up, right? Okay. <laughs> I don't feel so bad now then. <laughs> um, and the, what I have found, well, I, what, one of the things I do is I avoid doing anything illegal. You know, people right, ask me, are you worried about uh, getting arrested? I said, no, because I don't do anything illegal. You're allowed to talk about anything in free speech. I talk about how to do this type of therapy. Mm -hmm. Now, um, when people ask me, how do you get the medicine? I say, uh, there's a, a, uh, app known as signal. Are you familiar with the signal app? Mm -hmm. We are. Yes. It's encrypted and you can go on there and say, you're interested in getting MDMA medicine. Now, if I were wanting to get MDMA medicine, I would make sure that I knew the person selling it, or I knew somebody who had taken the same batch right. because, mm -hmm. or I would get a test kit to make sure that anything I received was pure. Right. But this way I avoid doing anything illegal. And even my uh, people learning how to do this therapy are not doing it. They're just <clears throat> telling their clients to go on Signal and uh, see what they can find. Now, Signal, Signal luckily is fully encrypted. The law enforcement doesn't get into it. Um, and I guess that's what we need to do until it is medically prescribed. Right, right. And then even then, it's, it, I mean, in a lot of states, marijuana is uh, generally legal. It's, you don't need a prescription for it. Mm -hmm. Other states you do. MDMA, when it's first legalized medicinally, you will have to have uh, a, a doctor who helps you to acquire this medicine. So Signal might still be around for a while. Yeah, it might. <laughs> because <laughs> okay. right. that's the question that's been you know you hear all about all this stuff on the shows and it's like that's great but how do i get it like what do you do because it's, it's it's really it's it's not it's not it's unfortunately not legal after we've talked almost an hour now about the wonderful benefits of this kind of medicine if done the right way the problem is sometimes people don't do it the right way and that's why 
one yeah. bad apple spoils a batch. Right? Mm-hmm. And I want to, you know, in the book, I also talk about other contraindications. Um, people on SSRIs, uh, antidepressant medicines, usually have to go to a very low dose before mm-hmm. they can feel this medicine. Uh, I have people work with a doctor to lower their their uh, antidepressant medicines over like a two or three month period because it just the, it's the same neurotransmitter pathway. It mutes the response, uh, mm-hmm. and also you know one third of people do feel tired and kind of well just tired the next day. Mm-hmm. Uh, in my book, I talk about how to prevent that. But, you know, for people who have had like, God, I took it years ago, I felt really exhausted for a day or two. That is not uncommon, but there are ways to mitigate that. Great. How long does it last? How long does that feeling that, you, that it gives you last? Um, generally four to five hours, something like that. Oh, okay. So you get a good money's worth. Yeah. I would yeah. say. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and it's funny, the people I do this with on Zoom, they have no trouble sitting and talking to me the entire time without a break on Zoom. They never ask for a break. <laughs> I usually say, hey, you know, we've been here four hours. Can I, can I go to the toilet, you know? Does it, ha- does it have like a, a, a speedy feel to it that, that makes you, um, I mean, you hear people who are on methamphetamines or even cocaine will, will just become really chatty. Is that same type of thing? Uh, I wouldn't say it does that. It does make you very alert, but um, some people will actually, you know, when they're opening to love, they don't feel like talking that much. You know, this is <laughs> great. You know, let me just right. bask in that. Right. But some people so, do get chatty. And do you typically, when you're with your your clients or your patients during this, are, are you on the whole time with them usually? Or is it just a couple hours and then you just let them go and enjoy? I'm on the whole time. Um, okay. And, you know, one of the reasons I do this, uh, Will and Karen, is um, I get a contact high. Have you ever been around somebody <laughs> who's, who's feeling like yes. this is like the best time I've had in years? Yes. Well, you know, you, you're sharing it. I don't take the medicine, but I do get a contact high, and, and that's kind of fun. <laughs> Out of all the things you said this entire night, that has to be the most amazing thing you said so far. <laughs> That's awesome. Wow. Uh, no, it's really fun. Um, and, and you know, that's not just me. The people that I've trained, they, they say, uh, well, you know, I, I charge money for this, but I do it for free because I get so high when I'm helping people with it, you know? That's awesome. Oh, gosh. Now, I remember one of the things that everyone said when, when my friend took it way back then is you had to constantly drink water. You had to keep hydrating. You had to rehydrate yourself because if you didn't, uh, it was, it, it, you could really hurt yourself. Is that true? Well, it's true depending on the setting. It's not true that you actually have to drink any more water on MDMA than usual. But the people taking it were in a hot uh, dance club dancing for seven hours. Well, if you dance for seven hours and it's hot, you need to drink a lot of water. <laughs> Got it. Got it. Um, yeah. But if you're sitting talking to a guy on Zoom, you know, taking a sip of water once an hour is usually pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. All right. So then you've done, like you said, about 800 journeys on this stuff. You yeah, must have some. Le- right. I'm sorry. Leading, not, not oh. journeys yourself, but leading journeys. <laughs> you must have incredible stories of people that went through some sort of transformation. Can you share some stories with us to get us to the place where we feel more comfortable doing something like this? Yeah. Well, l- let me first share a story of uh, Martha and Joe, who I'd been working with for a year in my office, not getting any progress. they have been arguing about money for 10 hours a week for 30 years. And um, finally, you know, they didn't want to get divorced because of finances. I said, hey, the only thing I think it's going to help is MDMA. And, you know, they were in their 60s, but they decided to give it a shot. Um, And, you know, the whole hate and resentment and uh, issue just dissolved. Like power struggles, you know. The whole thing. You know, it's very hard to work out a problem with somebody you hate and don't trust. Mm-hmm. It's very easy to solve a problem with somebody you totally adore and you trust implicitly. So it took about 15 minutes to come up with a solution. They both said, great. And they you know, just loved each other. Well, you know, I always do an integration session a week later, you know, uh, over Zoom. 
not on the medicine, but just to make sure that everything's good and how to take the insights and put it into their life. And mm -hmm. I said, how'd that, you know, the agreement go? And they said, this is the first week in 30 years we haven't argued. We didn't know that we even liked each other, but now we know we love each other. And it was, it was, it was so powerful to them. They thought it was like total magic. Wow. And, wow. Um, and the agreement that we made, uh, I, I, I made the, I told them, why don't you just give Martha 300 bucks this week to spend any way she wants. And he said, that's a ridiculous amount of money, but you know, if it will keep her quiet for a week. Okay. And Martha said 300 bucks. That's so little. How can I possibly do that? That cheap bastard. You know? uh, but they were willing to do it for a week. Well, after a week I said, does that work for you? And they both said, well, it's totally unfair, but I'm happy to do it because anything that can get us to not argue uh, works for me. And we're now we're in love. <laughs> Wow. So, oh, that's wonderful. All right. So what do you say to those people that feel that maybe it's the drug that has drugged them into thinking they're in love rather than them actually feeling love for each other? Uh -huh. Well, I judge things by the results. So if a week later they're still in love and they've worked through their problems, which is what I tried to do on the session, then I don't care whether it was chemical or not. If they're in love now, not on the medicine, and they work through their problems, that got me and got them the results that they want. What I find is when uh, people can let go even temporarily of their defenses and rationally work through their problems, all these obstacles to love tend to dissipate. And what's left is we like to feel connected to people if those obstacles aren't mm -hmm. like in the way. Yeah. So then uh, along the same line, someone who's doing it for spiritual purposes, uh, you hear a lot of people say it's, you know, these things are crutches and it's, it doesn't really help in the long run because you really need to find it within yourself. It, the same argument could apply. Maybe it's the drug that's making me feel this way, not me tapping into anything. How yeah. do you respond to that? Well, the drug is making them feel that way. The question is, uh, what's normally in the way? You know, when people are on the drug like this, I usually ask them, so um, Will, or not that you took it, but your friend named Will. Right, right, my friend. <laughs> yes, yeah. very good friend. Yeah, very yeah. good friend. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I might say, so what's normally in the way of you feeling this way? And we go into that. If you can see the obstacles and you can work through them therapeutically, what's left, in my belief, is we do have a loving nature at the core. You know, you look at the average three-year-old having a good time in life. You know, there's not so many obstacles. They're laughing a lot. They're playing. They're not thinking about their taxes. You know, it's it's a lot better. <laughs> so um, I, I use the information to help people when they're not on the medicine get back to that place that they felt on the medicine. And I do believe that's more of our natural state. Right. That's what they say, right? We, that we, we are love and we just forget when we come here and we're trying to get back to that place. And we talked about it the first time you were here on the mm -hmm. show. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I cannot believe that we've been at this for as long as we have. It, it is the time, literally, you are a time warp. <laughs> Whenever we talk to you, it's like two seconds and it's already almost over. It's well, I put some extra yeah. in your waters, Will. So, you know. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I had a it's feeling. It's actually four hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's really tomorrow. Oh, I got a hell of an edit job ahead of me. <laughs> uh, so, but before we go, I'd love to hear one more story. What's your favorite story having to do with MDMA? Well, besides my parents' story, which was, I thought, oh, hysterical that when that yeah. happened. Um, you know, I, I get emails every day. I, I, I'll tell you the one that happened today. Um, the okay. woman said, you know, my only regret is I didn't do this 30 years ago because it feels like I've been looking through, like, glasses that were totally dirty and fogged up. And now I see clearly... And every day I'm like so thankful for my, my health, my, my kids, my house, my electricity. You know, how is it that I wasn't feeling that before? Um, and, and it's so close. You know, mm -hmm. we get caught up in our minds and our minds are only about a foot away from our heart. Mm. But that can be... It's only a foot away one way, but if you go north, it's 25,000 miles, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. So um, she says, I feel like you gave me my heart back. And it's not what I did. It's that 
she discovered how to open her own heart. And once you have that, you have a friend for life. Wow. That's so that's, beautiful. that's what I'm trying to do is give, give people the recipe to their own natural openness. And, uh, and then, you know, in the integration session, we talk about how to the little practices you can do to keep that going. Mm. Wow. Karen, hmm? we're doing this. All right. We're doing it. We're doing it. Jonathan, we're going to reach out to you. Yes. We're doing, it's, can we, do we have to be like on a, on a couch or together? Could we do it on a microphone? Like, could we record the session if we do Ooh, this with you? That might be weird. But, yeah, no, uh, I cool always record the sessions. I always oh, record you do. the sessions. Ooh. People oh, find oh, oh, oh. Do they know? No, okay. Yeah, they do. They do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I sell that on the black market on Signal. <laughs> <laughs> you trade it for uh, for ecstasy. <laughs> the guy that's has a whole to make living, other kind know? of no. Um, yeah, that's, that's a whole other kind of OnlyFans page. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I have them record it, and uh, they listen to it, and they say that the recording is just mind blowing for them because they feel like that's them at their best, and it gives them uh, a clarity as to who they would be if some of these obstacles were out of the way. Right. So probably way too personal to release as a podcast is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I think that's what Karen's how, saying. It depends on you, but you know. <laughs> right. Oh my gosh. Jonathan, I, I swear you, we, you need to come back a third time because I just, I, I can't. Oh my God. It's so much fun. It goes it's like by, fun and learning. It wow. does. Yeah. It goes by <laughs> so fast. The book is called Ecstasy yeah. as Medicine. Mm -hmm. And is it out now? Can people uh, get it in on Amazon or is it Kindle, so waiting paperback, to... audiobook, um, smoke signals, whatever you want. And then someone wanted to reach out to you specifically to perhaps talk about maybe a guided journey. What's the best way for someone to do that? Well, they can reach me through the website, which is xtcasmedicine.com. Perfect. Great. Well, we're going to add a link to that website directly. Uh, also, possibly a link directly to the book, because I think that if more people were open to the possibility of something like this, to Karen's point earlier in the, in the show, this might just change the world. And that's we need a little we need a lot more love in a the world. A lot right more now. love. Yeah, don't. we do. We do. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, as always, thank you so, so much for coming and on the we show. We just love you. We do. Well, we do. And I'm not afraid likewise. to say that. And we're not even on ecstasy. I um, know. <laughs> can you imagine? <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> Jonathan, thank you so much for coming on again. We'll talk again soon for sure. Okay. Sounds great. And a huge thank you to you. Yes, you, the person that hit play on this episode. We'd love for you to contribute by sending us a voicemail or an email from our website or leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or any other podcasting platform that supports them. Karen and I love hearing from those that are moved to message us. It truly does fuel our passion. You are the reason we do this show. And knowing what you like and don't like help us craft the very best show we can so that we can help raise the vibration of the planet together. Well, that's all for now. We will see you on the next episode of The Skeptic Metaphysician. Until then, take care.